give everybody another minute or two. My goodness gracious. Um, everybody take a seat as quickly as possible. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Kathy Wang from Synac Labs will today be pre uh, presenting Frustrating OS Fingerprinting with Morph. Uh, before this, she has worked uh, at Compaq as well as with Counterpane Internet Security. She's presented at numerous conferences, including Nauticon. Okay, shameless whoring for that one since, well, yeah. Anyway, uh, as I said, Kathy will be presenting uh, her presentation on Morph today. Here you go, Kathy. Have a good presentation. Thank you. I'm Kathy Wang, and I'm here today to talk about Morph, which is a tool that I've been working on since uh, late February this year. And um, as Foggy said, I did speak on this at Nauticon. Okay, so let's get started. We have lots of material to go through. But what I'd like to start with is um, give you a sense of OS fingerprinting history and what's been going on there and then get to the real thing, Morph, which I'm here to talk about today. Um, Morph was built on certain libraries, so I'd like to go into more detail about that. And then the architecture that Morph was built on, of course, is gonna be very important. There were some implementation problems that I had with Morph along the way, and I'm going to share those with you as well. And of course, Morph isn't anywhere near done as I'd like to see it, so there's some future considerations for more work on Morph. And there were some people who helped me out with Morph, and finally, for questions, um, I have a special request. My hearing isn't really what it could be, so, um, and in a room this size, it could be difficult to hear questions, so I'm going to be asking a hearing assistant to come up here and relay the questions to me, so please save them for the end. That way we can make sure that I get them all. Okay, so what is OS fingerprinting? Back in the days before Queso came out, people used to look at, you know, banner information that got thrown back when they would do a telnet or some connection attempt and based on that type of information, they can determine what OS they're dealing with. Um, there's also manual reconnaissance, which involves things like reading email lists to see what system administrators from certain companies ask questions about. Uh, how do I deal with, you know, AIX, this version? So then you say, oh, well, that's the company that uses AIX servers. So based on information like that, and I guess some people would do uh, dumpster diving type things, you can figure out what type of systems a place is running. Then after fingerprinting came along, starting with Queso, and the point for active fingerprinting is to send packets to a certain target host and elicit for responses from them and based on the responses, you can figure out who they are. Passive fingerprinting is a little bit different in approach because instead of sending packets to the remote host to get information back to make determinations, you're simply just sniffing on the same subnet um, and based on the type of packet that you see coming across your interface, you can determine what OS they are. Timing analysis fingerprinting is sort of a very subset area of active fingerprinting because it is sending out packets to the target host and looking for a response as well. But with timing analysis, um, you're looking at, well, let's say you send out a SIM packet and they send a SIM app back while you're dropping that packet and then seeing how long it takes them to continually keep sending you SYN app packets so you can determine based on the timing difference what OS they are. Okay, so I talked about the different types. Let's talk about the tools that are out there. Um, the first tool was Queso, which is an active fingerprinting tool. And 
it was、um, based on sending packets to open ports on the target host. And I'll be going into a lot more detail about these tools later. And then MMAP came out and utilized some of Queso's techniques, except instead of only sending packets to open ports, it also sends packets to closed ports.、Um, the passive OS fingerprinting tools that came out, like I mentioned in the previous slide, sit on the subnet and listen for what type of packets that it gets, and based on that information, determine the OS. Xprobe 2 is a very good tool. It's an ICMP active fingerprinting、um, tool, which instead of just looking at like TCP header type responses, it looks at ICMP. And Ring is actually a proof of concept tool. I don't think this tool was ever released. There were white papers released about how it works, but not an actual tool. But it's looking at timing analysis, like I mentioned in the previous slide. So, how many people in this room have ever done a pen test? Okay, so we have a pretty good number of people. When you go and do pen tests, you're interested in knowing what your target host OS is. That's one of the most important piece of, pieces of information that you can get about the host, because based on that information, you can then make determinations about, you, you know, what kind of exploit you're going to run against that host.、Um, so this is very, very important information. Now, OS scanners know something. Okay, they know that like vendors, you know, implement OS stacks differently. Depending, I mean, everyone looks at RFC 793 for TCP implementation, but everyone has kind of a different way of doing it. And I'm not here to bash vendors or say that you know vendors aren't following the rules as defining RFCs. But there really are legitimate gray areas. And you know, for example, what do you do when someone sends you a TCP header with the flags, you know, sim fin urge push set? I mean, or how do you like respond to a fin? Different vendors would do that differently, and based on that information, that's the kind of information that OS scanners exploit to、um, determine what OS the target host is. So, in essence, I guess the OS being honest about who they are because they have to respond as they were implemented makes them a target. All right. So, like I mentioned, I've been working on Morph since late February, and what Morph is is when it's compiled and installed on a certain host,、um, it runs as a user land process, and the goal for Morph is to be able to emulate Windows 2000, Linux 2.4, and、um, OpenBSD 3.3. Well, right now, Morph will emulate Windows 2000 and OpenBSD 3.3. So I haven't actually gotten the Linux 2.4 kernel stuff implemented yet. Now, what Morph will do is Morph will modify packet information to fool the remote host,、um, and that packet header information can be TCP headers, UDP headers, ICMP, no IP headers. And currently, Morph will actually compile and install on a Linux 2.4 kernel. I haven't gotten it working for Windows or、um, OpenBSD or the other BSDs yet,、uh, but that's in the works.、Uh, I definitely wouldn't take Morph and install it on a production quality machine,、um, just because if you do that, I'm not responsible for what happens. <laughs> Now, Morph is BSD licensed, so you can download it for free at synaplab.net/projects/morph-url. So please feel free and download it. It's available right now, and play around with it. And let me know what you think. Okay.、Um, if it wasn't for packet purgatory, I wouldn't have been able to write Morph nearly as easily. And just to give you an idea, using packet purgatory has 
probably reduce the number of lines of code for more like by 4,000 or something. So that's good for me. Um, so Morph is built on packet purgatory, which acts as a wedge between the OS kernel and the interface. And Packet Purgatory Library was written by uh, Todd McDermott, who's also a Synap Lab member, and sitting over there. Okay. <laughs> um, now, Packet Purgatory is built on libpcap and libdnet libraries. Morph uses libpcap to sniff on the interface and uses uh, libdnet to write raw IP and ethernet writes. Um, from a high level standpoint, this is what Morph looks like. And I'm going to be drilling down into more detail about this shortly. But you can see that there's a remote host associated. And then based on whether the remote host is the one initiating the connection or our host, the host OS kernel, is the one initiating the connection, you can see that packet purgatory is that wedge between um, the interface and the kernel. So it blocks all the packets from going directly to the kernel and instead intercepts and sends those packets along to Morph, which does its handling job. And to give you an idea of the Morph architecture, uh, packet purgatory didn't just disappear. It's actually part of the Morph picture here because I built Morph on packet purgatory library. But Morph is consisted of three main parts, an inbound handler, a state table, and an outbound handler. So all incoming packets to our host OS come through the inbound handler. Okay? And based on whether that packet is destined for an open port or a closed port, um, inbound will either respond directly to the remote host in the case of closed port destination, or it will pass the packet along to our host OS kernel if it's destined for an open port. And I like to use the kernel to do some of the response work because it makes it a lot less work for me with Morph. I mean, why not? It's there already. So if the packet gets passed along to the host OS kernel, the host OS kernel will respond accordingly, um, depending on how it's implemented. And then it will pass that packet along to outbound handler. And then the outbound handler will then modify headers or you know, will do what it needs to take, uh, do in order to convince the remote host that this is not the OS that we don't want to be. So there's also a state table involved. And the state table is um, useful. It's a hash table. And right now, it has four pieces of information in it. It has the source IP, destination IP, source port, and destination port. And the state table is useful for when, for example, we initiated a SYN connection with a remote host. And we need to record that information in the state table so that when the remote host responds with a SYN app, we'll know that's part of a legitimate ongoing connection as opposed to, you know, when MMAP sends a SYN app packet to us and we have to say, oh, well, this is a, you know, this doesn't make sense and it's not part of a connection. So that's what the state table is useful for. Now, packet purgatory, this is just more information about it. Um, it's also available for download, free download. And it's actually not a kernel module. It's a user land process. And um, packet purgatory actually comes in a couple of modes. And let me go into more detail about that. There's a proxy mode and there's a loopback firewall mode. So, if we look at the proxy mode first, um, by the way, you would use the proxy mode of Morph um, if your firewall isn't supported by libdnet. So for example, if it's not IPF, PF, or IP chains, then you would use proxy mode. Okay? And the advantage of using proxy mode is that uh, your firewall rules aren't blocked. right? So you can still maintain the same rules. But from a, um, in a nutshell, if you look at the proxy mode, 
What happens is、uh, the remote host, let's say for example, remote host sends a packet in. Inbound gets the packet via packet purgatory,、uh, pushing the packet over because of libpcap sniffing on the interface. And if that packet is destined for a closed port, then inbound will do a raw IP write via libdnet and respond directly to that host. Now, if that packet is destined for an open port, then、um, Morph will actually do a raw IP write via libdnet and then send that along to the host OS kernel. The host OS kernel will take the packet and respond however it's going to respond to it, and then that packet will make its merry way along, and、um, packet purgatory will intercept it again via libpcap. And send it to outbound, which will rewrite the packet or modify the packet so that、um, it's proper response, and、uh, do a raw IP write via libdnet, send it back. So that's how the proxy mode works. Loopback firewall mode. This is the mode that you will use if you're using IPF, PF, or IP chains. And what happens is、um, packet purgatory actually blocks your firewall, so your firewall rules no longer apply. Okay. Now, so when the remote host sends a packet,、uh, packet purgatory is there via OS firewall blocking, and then send that packet along to inbound. And inbound is going to either respond directly to the Remote host or pass it along to the kernel, depending on whether it was destined for an open or closed port. And you can see that it's very similar, except this time instead of、um, we're going to do raw Ethernet writes this time, because if we don't and we do a raw IP write, the packet's going to go back to the loopback interface. Okay, and we don't want that. But I'd like to note that.、Um, When the packet gets sent along by the inbound handler,、um, there's information such as like the source IP address gets changed, so that like we don't actually, you know, we actually send it to the right place. Okay,、um, there are certain OS scanners that more for full, KSO, NMAP, and XPro.、Um, I'm still working on. Following the passive OS fingerprinting tool, and of course the timing analysis tool, I'm still working on that as well. But hopefully we'll get that done soon. It's worth mentioning that there have been other tools in the past that defeat OS fingerprinting. For example, there's FPF and there's IP personality. I like IP personality quite a bit. Um, except that it's actually written as a patch for the Linux 2.4 kernel, which makes it not very portable. Okay, not portable. So my aim here with Morph is to write a tool that does OS emulation and is also portable. So because I figured most of the people who are running Morph maybe are administering Windows systems. I mean, you know, they want to fool people into thinking they're not Windows. So I think it would be very useful. To have something that works for Windows,、um, FPF I tried to use and it actually didn't compile cleanly, so、um, it's pretty buggy. But it's also kernel module, so and I think later on they also adapted it as a kernel module for OpenBSD. So it's still not portable. Okay, so just to summarize the techniques: the active fingerprinting, passive fingerprinting, and timing analysis. They can all be defeated with Morph. And you know, I mean, if you're running Morph on your system, you own that system, so you should have ultimate control over what that system says. Okay,、uh, before we do the talk about more, I'd like to do a demo. A board for you. Okay, so this should be big enough font for everyone to see.
Hold on, let me get this. I had the sauce set up, now it's lost. Okay, let's try that again. All right, great. Okay, so what we have here is we have our host here that is running Morph. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an Nmap scan from this host first against this host without running Morph and let you see that it's a Linux 2.4 kernel host. And just to make it quicker, I'm going to pick one open port and one closed port. All right. Okay, so you can see based on the scan that this is a Linux 2.4 kernel host. Now I'm going to run Morph on this host. Uh, let's make it Windows 2000. Run a map again. All right, so now you can see it says it's Windows to uh, Windows host. Wait, there's one more. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna run this as OpenBSD. And there we have it. So it's open BSD. So. Okay, so that was the demo. So now you have a much better idea of what Morph is doing, right? Anyway, um, so now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the implementation of more um, based on how different OS scanners behave. There's Queso, which I chose to start with because I thought it would be the easiest case to start with. And it actually sends seven different packets to the remote host, to the target host. Um, and all of those packets are destined for open ports. And they're all TCP header type packets. Here I put together a table that um, shows what Morph does behavior wise to those different packets that are sent by Queso. Most of the cases aren't very interesting. Um, for example, I'm just going to go over a couple of them. For a thin packet, if you're running Windows, Windows will respond to a fin with a reset. Okay, now if you're running, you know, Linux or OpenBSD or something, it just won't respond to that. So in this case, we have to know that, okay, we're trying to emulate Windows, so we need to have inbound, you know, respond directly to that packet because the underlying kernel is Linux and it's not going to respond to that packet. So we have to you know, be able to convince the scanner. And by the way, just in case uh, anyone got the idea that Morph only deals with the packets sent by scanners, that's not the case. Morph is actually designed to deal with every single packet that it receives. Okay, so it's a total solution to behaving like the OS that you want to be. 
And the reason why that is is because if you plan on fooling the passive OS fingerprinting tools and you only deal with the packets sent by you know, scanners, then you're not going to be convincing in that factor. Now, X-Probe 2 was the next tool that I chose to work with because most of those packets sent are ICMP informational type packets. And that's pretty easy. You just have inbound respond to those informational type packets all the time. So you don't even have to loop it through the kernel itself. Um, so ICMP headers, four different types. Uh, one of those is really interesting. It's a uh, information request packet. And so, of course, I was like, what's that? So I look at um, TCP IP Illustrated Volume 1, read that section, and it says it's obsolete. Okay, so I'm like, well, what's going on? How come they're sending obsolete packets? Who's going to, you know, deal with that? So I look at the fingerprint file for Xcode 2 and found that, like, AIX deals with that. So I'm like, hmm, not very modern, are they? You know, so that was an interesting case for one of the cases. And of course, uh, Xcode 2 also sends a UDP packet for ICMP unreachable and also a vanilla SIM packet, regular SIM packet. And here's the table again for how Morph deals with Xcode 2. Uh, you can see that it's not horribly interesting. Most things are responded to kind of like what you would expect. Now, Nmap I chose to save for last in this process so far because it's actually the most complex of all of them. And, oh, I didn't mention about Xprobe 2, but you know how Xprobe 2 does the fuzzy fingerprinting um, technique where, you know, it determines what percentage chance there is that your target host is this OS? So it doesn't have to have like an exact match in fingerprints, okay? It just has to have like, it does percentages. And I was like, hey, well that's uh, actually a joke itself because that makes it easier for me, like writing more to like pull that. Because all I have to do is be approximate. I don't have to match exactly like I do with Nmap. So um, I like the fuzzy fingerprinting idea, but from the standpoint of trying to frustrate OS scanners, you know, makes it easier. But, okay, so Nmap needs open ports and closed ports in order to be as successful as possible in making its determination. So if you run, run Nmap, I'm sure most of you have, and uh, you look at like the messaging and it says, okay, TCP sequence prediction is going to be more difficult, that type of message, that's because, you know, it couldn't find uh, open port or something like that, and, and then it, half of its cases doesn't work. So that's why that's a problem. Um, Nmap is challenging because it has to be an exact match. And if it's not an exact match, then it spits out, I don't know, send me this fingerprint, you know, and I'll figure it out. Uh, there's nine different types of packets, five to open ports and four to closed ports. And here's the table for Nmap. You can see on the left that I have the open port section and then the closed port section. And most of these cases, well, obviously all the closed port, we're going to have inbound deal directly with responding to it. And the open ports, um, null is just none of the flags are set. Uh, Symphon, urge push, that depends on what OS you're dealing with. Some will respond to that and some won't. Um, but that's the cases for Nmap. Now I mentioned the morph state table and I hadn't actually gotten into a lot of detail about it yet. But the state table, as I mentioned earlier, is very useful for maintaining session state. But it's also going to be useful for doing things like uh, sequence number generation offsets. And the reason why that is, is if you're running an underlying OS, like uh, OpenBSD or Linux, where your sequence number generation is truly random, 
and then you want to emulate Windows 2000, where the sequence number generation is not truly random. Um, it's random incremental. And uh, so what are you going to do in that case? Let's say our underlying OS initiates a connection. So it's a SIM packet, goes out via outbound. Well, but that sequence number was randomly generated because our underlying OS is Linux. But we're trying to be Windows. So what we're going to do is outbound is going to generate a random or as random as Windows can be number. Okay, and then take the offset between that newly generated number and the number that was generated by our underlying OS and save that information in the state table so that the remote host will think, still think that this is Windows. And when the remote host replies with a SYN app, uh, you know, then we're going to take that offsite information that's stored in the state table and we're going to apply it to that number in the acknowledgement numbers um, so that we can stay consistent within the underlying OS. So that's one of the useful, other useful things that the state table can do. And the state table will also be used to um, deal with timing analysis type of scanners because when you have a certain OS that you're supposed to emulate and a tool like Ring is looking for how often you're retransmitting certain packets, then you need to know what the timing allowance is for the OS that you're trying to emulate so you can be consistent in retransmitting those packets. And I've had people ask me before, so what do you do if your packets get retransmitted in X amount of time, let's say, and then you um, didn't get it retransmitted fast enough to meet that time that you're supposed to. Well, I always tell them it's okay because packets are always getting lost anyway. So what you just do is wait for the next opportunity that comes along to retransmit it. So don't worry about the one that you miss opportunities. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, I'm still working on the passive OS fingerprinting. By default, that is looking for SYN packet information. So I'm looking at that right now. And uh, the timing analysis analysis, timing, packet timing analysis um, stuff for Ring. And also, I mentioned snap time because that was a tool that I found which uses timing analysis and also some properties of passive analysis and actually implemented it so that it's downloadable and installable. So it's not proof of concept. Now, earlier this year at CanSec West, there was a talk. I don't know how many people here were there. Did you see that talk? Yeah, okay, a couple people. So most people haven't. But I believe the guy who did this talk works at NFR or something, and um, he was talking about new fingerprinting techniques. And it's not like the new techniques are beyond, you know, active or passive or timing analysis. They just expand on those areas more in ways that haven't been done before. For example, um, he'll use layer 7 information. And how does he do that? Uh, for example, he'll send, you know, like an HTTP GET uh, packet over and then see, like, what kind of, you know, um, the host will respond back to that and then he'll drop that packet and the host will retransmit. And apparently when uh, application level packets get retransmitted by a certain host OS, it's different timing intervals than, like, when it's, like, TCP header retransmits. Okay, so he'll use that different information from the applications to make his determination on what OS is. So that's pretty novel because that hasn't been done before. So that is actually a timing analysis expansion technique. And he'll also do things like um, measure window behavior under congested conditions. And what I mean by that is um, every OS um, implementation has window sizes, certain window sizes, and um, those sizes are like buffers. And when data gets transmitted over, 
uh, let's say, you know, Linux allows like 5.7K, okay, window size, and Windows is like 64K or something. So then when Windows transmits over and you're trying to be Windows, but your underlying OS is, you know, Linux, then you have the problem with having to, and that's another thing that I do with the state table, is um, you're having the problem of like telling people that your window size is this, when it's in reality on the kernel side is smaller than that. So they'll send you all this information at one time and you'll be like, well, I, you know, I need to save the information, the state table, and kind of read off of that you know, as it goes along because I can't handle that much data at one time on the underlying OS side. So um, what he'll do is he'll look at the buffer um, information stuff and like the target host will send a request for more information when the buffer gets read off and he'll look at the timing for that that gets sent and determine what OS it is. Now, I keep talking about getting fingerprinted. How can you avoid getting fingerprinted? Well, I guess the hard way to do it is to try to push for a new RFC so that all these unspecified, unspecified behavior uh, packets can get addressed. You know, so how does everyone deal with this and try to make it consistent across all of the uh, implementations, but that's the hard solution. Now the easier solution is that you can place hardened um, critical high value target servers behind a proxying device, right? So that every time someone's trying to talk to one of those machines that are your high value targets, it's actually talking to the proxying device and um, all they can do is figure out the fingerprint, the OS for the proxying device and not the guys behind the proxying device. And if you're really, really paranoid, you can do that setup and then you can like install something like more on the processing device so that they'll never know what any of those OS's are. Now, there were a lot of challenges to implementing more and one of them is the different window size than what the underlying OS is like I was just talking about. So how do you deal with, you know, if your underlying OS window size is smaller than what you're advertising to the remote host? Um, having to maintain connection state to determine whether something's normal or not is, is a challenge. Um, even if you run Morph, okay, so you're running Morph, and if someone was like a casual attacker, and all they cared about was just running a mass scan out there to see what OS's are available so that they can start targeting specific hosts after that information, then Morph can help you with that. But if they've already decided that they're going to target you and they're going to run, you know, um, application scanning or, you know, like a port scan against you, and they see that you're advertising that you're open BSD, but you got not BIOS ports open. Well, Morph isn't going to help you there. Okay, so it's, it's good for casual attackers, but it's not good for if you're already a target, a serious target. Also, there are exploits out there, like the Nimda Worm, which doesn't care who you are. I mean, it's just going to go around and knock on every single door. And if you're Windows, well, running Morph isn't going to help you there. Right? And I want to emphasize that Morph is not really like a security solution, a complete solution. All it is is, is one additional layer that you can use. So don't think that this is an overall solution. What would I like to do for Morph in the future? I really would like to support more OS emulation. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to get Linux in here. I want to build Morph, compile and install Morph on Windows. The challenge with that right now is that Morph um, open closed port determination implementation is not, you know, it's not like Windows compatible right now. 
So what I was thinking was that I could use a uh, POSIX compliant, like I could use uh, open, bind, and close. And those are POSIX compliant, and I'll be able to use those to determine whether a port is open or not by saying open, you know, a port. And if it succeeds, then that means that the port was closed. So um, close it back up, and now I know that the port was closed. Okay, and if I um, and if it doesn't open, it fails. Then I know that the port was actually open. So, based on that information, I can like determine whether a port's open or closed. Now, there's going to be some computational issues with that, but I'm still looking around for how I'm going to do this for Windows. Um, Obviously, I'd like to for other standards like the passive OS fingerprinting stuff and timing analysis type scanning. And everybody wants to add GUIs to their stuff, so I guess I'll add a GUI to Morph. All right, um, these are some people who help me out with Morph in one way or another. Uh, Todd wrote Packet Purgatory, which was immensely useful to me. And um, some of these people looked at my slides and made suggestions and stuff. And other people like called me from Kansas West to tell me what it was like, you know. Okay, so now we have the questions section, and I'm going to invite Todd up here to help me out. Any questions? The question was, what type of network congestion or performance costs does Morph have? Okay, um, I did like a SCP on my local network with Morph, uh, host running Morph, and um, it took like almost eight seconds to do it when it's running Morph and like about four seconds to do it when it's not running Morph, but that's on a local network. Now, if we're dealing with remote connections, then we're going to have a different picture. It's going to be a lot less noticeable because, you know, it's a remote connection this time. Did you program Morph in such a way so it's easy to put in new OS uh, spoofing implementations? Are the OS uh, implementations that you're spoofing hard-coded in right now, or is it pretty easy to put in new spoofing? Ah, um, yes, I program Morph so that the different cases are hard-coded in right now, but I'd like to eventually make it a reference table implementation so that it's easier to scale with all the different uh, fingerprints and stuff that MMAP has and things. So. What's the server overhead on it? Um, I actually haven't tested that, so I don't know. Do, do, do you mean like network overhead or CPU? CPU overhead. Yeah, I, I haven't tested that. Can Morph be used with a firewall at all? Yeah, uh, if you want the firewall rules to apply instead of getting blocked, then um, yeah, you can use Morph under the proxy mode. And then. What are your thoughts on the feasibility of evading timing based attacks? Uh, well, I think that if I'm going to be able to make more, a more comprehensive tool, I'm definitely going to have to evade those timing analysis attacks. Um, I talked about how I was going to use the state table to store that information between the timing of the packets so that I can do that. And I don't think it'll be very hard to do, but I actually haven't implemented it yet, so I'll see when I actually do.
when Morph is running in proxy mode, does it pass the packets directly to the kernel, or does it make more of a local tunnel connection? That's more of a packet purgatory question. Want me to get that? Okay. All right. Packet purgatory, when it's doing proxy mode, uh, is actually it's changing the source IP address. So the packet comes in remote to the proxy, gets rewritten so it's proxy IP to local, response goes from local to proxy, and then it goes back out from proxy to remote. The, the, the question was, if you've got a config file that restricts connections on the local subnet, what happens yeah. fundamentally? Yes, if you're running, if you're running packet purgatory in proxy mode, it's going to look to your local machine like it's coming from a local machine, and so you've got to think about that. That could impact your security policy. Yeah. The question was, since we're going to the trouble of emulating certain OS packet-based behavior, how difficult would it be to add in additional stub services so it appears that we're listening on NetBIOS even when we're not actually? Okay, um, I don't know if you saw on the slide, but I had in parentheses after the application scanning stuff Polymorph, which is um, a project that I'm looking at working on next, which will deal with um, NMAPS application scanning uh, capabilities. So I haven't started that yet, so I'm still thinking about that. But I think it's definitely worth looking at possibly implementing something to full application scanning. That, that's Honeydee, in a nutshell. <laughs> I don't want to re-implement Honeydee. Does Morph also emulate the time to live on the packets of the operating system? Oh yeah, the time to live is um, in the TC uh, in, in in the header. So yeah, Morph will actually modify that if it needs to, um, depending on what OS you want to emulate. You talked before about implementing Morph on Windows. What are your plans for that? Uh, well, as soon as I can figure out like writing the code for doing the open close port implementation, determining whether the port is open or closed. I'd like to do this under like a SIGWIN environment, but I have to spend some time doing that first. What's the commercial motivation for implementing Morph? Uh, well, I don't know that I was thinking about the commercial motivation. It's been a wonderful learning project for me. And I really like working on it because I think it's really cool. Now, commercially, it's BSD licensed, so people can do whatever they want with it that they you know, feel like doing. So um, I guess that's the most commercial aspect of it. Okay, well, I gotta go, so thank you very much.